Sometimes I'll log on to Twitch just to see what the Pokemon community is doing over there, maybe to get some new ideas, just see how everyone is, what's going on. And sometimes I get a little confused because it exposes one of my greatest weaknesses. The biggest flaw that I have in myself as a person is that I can't speak Spanish. So when I see the Pokemon streamers that speak Spanish over on Twitch with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of viewers, and I try to log on and watch, I'm thinking, what is, what is, what's happening? I don't understand, what is going on? And it was like that for a very long time. The, the only words I could make out was Twitch Cup. So there was a big Spanish event happening on Pokemon Twitch, and I had no idea what it was all about until now, because Pokemon Challenges has made a video all about it, I'm really curious to see what it's all about. I, I really don't know what happened there. The most viewed Pokemon tournament in the world is not the official VGC World Championships. It's actually- It's not even close. World. It's, it's yeah, it's- To be honest, this is quite sad. The Pokemon VGC World Championships doesn't really get the viewership that you kind of hope that it does. I feel like it should be a little bit bigger. There's a lot of YouTubers out there trying to bring more attention to it, which I think is great, but I wish it was a little bit bigger. I wish there was more discussion about it, but I suppose Pokemon is a game based around RNG, so it's not going to have the biggest following or fan base. It's not going to be the next Valorant or League of Legends. The Poke Cup, as it's called, has become a sensation in the Spanish-speaking parts of the... See, I, I didn't understand, like, what was going on here? You look at this, if you don't speak Spanish, you have no idea what's happening. I'm sure there's going to be some very intelligent individuals in the comments that are like, oh, I know exactly what's going on here. It's, it makes easy sense. I don't even struggle at all. But I see medals. I see random lock. I see 17 hearts. I see a team below me. I, I see a bug catching man. There's one separate Pokemon. There's different sprites here. There's 18, 19,000 people watching at once with 10,000 active paying members of this channel. And I'm like, what? How do we how do we not know about this? The internet. This incredibly original Pokemon competition took root in Spain in 2021, and for its third edition, held in November and December of 2023, they pulled out all the stops, being hosted by none Is other that than Ebay, the big It was hosted by Ebay? Okay. Okay, that's huge. Listen, if you're not big on Twitch and you don't know what that means, he's massive. I mean, you just look at the stats right here. He was the biggest Spanish streamer, and it's not even close. This is the guy that has booked out entire massive football stadiums to host his events. He is the big boy. Like, he is the guy for Spanish Twitch. Biggest streamer in the world. The Poker Cup is a competition held with 40 teams composed of streamers and experienced Pokemon players with two phases. The second phase is pretty simple. It's a Pokemon battling tournament, and for 2023, it would be played with VGC rules for the first time. Oh, that's really cool. I like that they're using the official rules. That is very sick. Now, this is the official in-game. They're using Pokemon Showdown in the Twitch Cup, though, it looks Double like. Battles. Bring a team of six Pokemon to the match and use four in each battle. All that good stuff. But it's the first phase that really separates Poke Cup from any other Pokemon competition I've ever seen. And it like what the, look at this. This is, it looks like it's a game that was made specifically for this event. That's what makes it the most interesting for my channel. The first phase is what determines what teams these players will be using in their battles. Their teams would have to be constructed from a box that survived a Nuzlocke playthrough. And oh my God, that's such a cool idea. That is such a genuinely sick idea. You do a randomizer Nuzlocke, you get the biggest streamers in the world. You do a randomizer Nuzlocke to determine your team and then use competitive VGC rules to find out who's the best. That is sick. Man, we we should we should do that. I I, I can't organize something like that, but that's a, such a cool idea. We should yoink that. This wasn't just any Nuzlocke. Delta. 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 Today's video is sponsored by the spring cleaning champions over at Manscaped. It's springtime, yeah. it's time to clean up your face, and Manscaped yeah, has is. two products just for you to do that. The first one is the Beard Hedger Pro. This is hey. a premium facial hair trimmer. My favorite feature is that it's got this zoom wheel to set exactly which length what? you want to trim your beard at. Just listen to how satisfying oh, You can zoom on that? That's insane. Come on, oh, that's any really length between yeah. five millimeters and 10 millimeters you can achieve with this thing. It's got titanium coating. God, I wish I had facial hair. Blades. The only thing is that it's a little big to travel with, but isn't okay. it great that Manscaped has another solution for that? With the second oh, product, they always have solutions. By my personal favorite Manscaped product, and I've been working with them for years now, the Handyman. I just got back from what, what a is that? 10 day trip to the US, and I was seeing a lot of people there going to meetings and going to events, and I need to keep myself fresh and clean, and this thing yeah. is perfect for that. It doesn't have quite thing. the amazing capabilities as 
the beard hedger, of course, but it's got a lot of power in there. If you just want to keep yourself clean, if you just want to trim that stuff, just whip it out just whenever it you nice need. And clean, maintain it. The in the middle of a meeting, for in the middle of it's dinner. It's really small, fits into every pocket, charges via USB C. You don't have to pack any additional cables or anything. We to call that with. seasoning There's on no the way pasta. You can actually turn on because the cover just slides over. It's amazing. I love this thing can, so much. It's like a phone as well. Trip that I've been on ever since I got it. If you want to check out any of these two products, go to the link in the description or in the pinned okay. comment. It's manscaped.com slash peachal. 20% off of either of these 20. products or any other big no. grooming products that you want. Thank you so much to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. Let's what? get back into it. The player Thank you, Manscaped, for sponsoring his video. In a fascinating near future world where the new social network Delta has an intriguing offer for them. Come live in this town of streamers away from all the regular people and riffraff. That's you, viewer. It seems like a great place to grow your brand, and they even have- Oh my god! It looks like Stardew Valley! <laughs> have a house all ready for you. But everything in Delta Land is not as it seems. Everybody's oh. acting all weird. Mmm, hola! Mmm, mmm, cowboy! One day, the player is taken from the capsule where what is all happening? streamers are living to Coach Headquarters, a group of people that is aware of Delta's nefarious plans to use the streamers for their own gain. The player's goal is to save the streamers Delta has been manipulating, and then take out the evil behind Delta. Listen, this is insane. They, they have built, they built a whole ROM with a whole storyline just to act as the first phase of this massive competition. Like, they put so much effort into this. They get the biggest streamers in the world. And they, wow, this is genuinely so impressive. I'll show you most of the plot details, but there's like a whole AI storyline and Mark Zuckerberg shows up. There's all What? <laughs> what? What's happening? There's crazy detail art for the story characters, boss fights, and even some sick, unique Pokemon sprites. Like, look at this beware. He's so chill. Gameplay-wise, this is still Pokemon. Badges are replaced with chips, and instead of taking on gym leaders, the player is taking on Delta's streamers in order to save them from the chips that are controlling them. It may- This is so sick, man. I wonder, does every- I, I assume that every single streamer that's taking part in this event is playing through this game and sharing it with their audience, and you're invested in what is happening in their playthrough of the game, because obviously the team, this is like the most convoluted then we fight that has ever existed. The, the, none of this, oh, we blindly choose our legendary starters. None of this, oh, we play a little bit of deal or no deal. None of that. No, we play, we create and gather together an event with all the biggest Spanish streamers that we could find. And we create a convoluted storyline in a game that is built from the ground up with new sprites and everything. We make them do a randomizer Nuzlocke on this new variation of the game that we've made, and then we're gonna battle. They have its own unique look, but it's still your typical eight badges into elite four structure that you're using. Whoa, 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 hey, whoa, whoa, what's that, what's that, what's that? Okay, okay, I'm just gonna, just gonna gloss over that one. Play loop, you know, and love. Poke Cup teams are made up of the main player, a streamer who tends to be newer to Pokemon, and their partner, a coach who's very, very experienced. A great example was last year's champions. The okay, so there's, there's three people on one Poke Cup team, all right. Streamer was Mixwell, who's best known for his illustrious professional Counter-Strike and Valorant career. And his coach was Poke Alex, one of Spain's best VGC players for nearly a decade and the winner of last year's North American International Championships. To make wow. sure it's truly a team effort, the coach's input is limited. They can help all they want with wild Pokemon battles. What are Juan? What are you Juan? Juan! <laughs> and they can plan out what are you doing Juan what are you doing Juan the trainer battles with their players beforehand but once the trainer battle starts the streamer is on their own no voice input from the coaches and their streamers even have to have their chat in emote only mode the thing is that's so smart so they can't get any coaching I really like the idea of this I really like it you're taking big streamers that maybe don't have a whole lot of Pokemon experience and you're putting them into an area you're giving them a little bit of help just enough to get them where they need to be and then they're on their own. That's a, that's a really cool idea. The goal isn't just to complete the Nuzlocke. The goal is to beat the Nuzlocke with a box that can actually hang in the second phase of the competition. Only your surviving Pokemon can be used in the actual tournament. Maybe you're tempted to use the Salamence you caught to get through a difficult trainer battle, but think twice because you're probably going to want it around for phase two. Despite a few optimal Pokemon standing out from the crowd, the ROM hack the streamers played for the Nuzlocke phase had enough randomness to ensure everybody didn't just bring the same team to the tournament. No. Spide Ops is in this? Hey, listen, that thing has sticky webs. Not that that's very good in VGC, but it's still, it's got sticky webs. Why is one of the Pokemon below me a, a, a soup? <laughs> you see that? Wait, wait, what is going on with the Pokemon below me? So we have a Luxray, we have the Ladybug thing that I forget the name on Orbeal, and then we have a bowl of soup, some kind of blue crab, and then a Persian. What's happening here? Not only were encounters fully randomized, but so were each Pokemon's abilities and movesets. Pokemon like Primarina, Garchomp, Snorlax, Dragapult saw lots of usage in this tournament because, well, they're good Pokemon. 
good stats, good typings, maybe even both. But the Pokemon caught in the Snuzzlocke also had random moves and random abilities. And it turns out Prima Arena might not be as threatening without Liquid Voice to boost its Hyper Voices. Garchomp kinda needs Earthquake, and Dragapult's speed is a lot less scary without moves like Dragon Darts or Shadow Ball to back it up. And Snorlax is great until it runs into a Ghost type while only knowing normal and Fighting type attacks. Hey, whoa, wait, this Rooster is insane though. Roost, Curse, Facade, and Drain Punch on a Snorlax. That is ludicrous. This guy is really lucky as a ghost type because if he didn't have one, he'd be, he'd be dead. He'd be, he'd be dying. He'd be dead on the floor. Even though a lot of Pokemon were repeated on the teams in this tournament, the trainers had to get creative with how they use them because there is no standard sets here. Just the same though, an often forgotten Pokemon might just be one great move or one awesome ability away from becoming a superstar. As a result, some of the like, heroes in this tournament were a little unexpected to say okay. the least. Meet Sopita. When Felipez ran in Oh, that was so bad that that was the name of the soup! That was the soup that was on the layout before! To this wild tranquil, he didn't think much of it. Nicknaming your Pokemon is one of the competition's rules, and he named it Sopita. Right away, Soup has a move that instantly makes her a potential member of Felipe's tournament squad. Fake Out. It's a move so potentially oh, okay. broken yeah. that Game Freak has limited it to just 33 fully evolved Pokemon. Yeah, Fake Out is fantastic. I mean, we all know Fake Out is fantastic. It causes a guaranteed flinch and it's priority. No reason not to Pokemon run it. Pokemon like Raichu, Scrafty, Palmont, and Togedomaru have managed to carve out niches because of it, despite mediocre stat spreads. Others like Incineroar- Especially useful in VGC when there's 2v2 formats, you can stop someone from moving for a turn and then use your other Pokemon to follow up for a kill. Or and Rillaboom go from merely great doubles Pokemon without it to top tier threats with it. Fake Out is a pretty good move in single battles where it's nothing more than a turn of free chip damage, but in doubles, it's one of the best moves in the game, allowing you to completely lock down one of your opponent's two Pokemon, leaving it as a sitting duck for your teammate. It shreds focus sashes, forces defensive plays like protecting or switching, and with its plus three priority, it's one of the strongest options to shut down fast opposing Pokemon in a metagame that relies on speed control through field conditions like Tailwind and Trick Room. Still, plus three priority means that it can outspeed things like extreme speed too. Sopita needs to be able to do something on the subsequent turns. She had fine normal type damage with return, but nothing to take advantage of her flying type and the incredible ability she rolled, Gale Wings, which grants priority to flying type moves at full health. Oh man, that is an insane ability too. It's a too bad Unpheasant is really not that good usually. Its stats are pretty mediocre. No one really cares about Unpheasant. Everyone's always like, Staraptor, ooh, Staraptor. No one ever say Unpheasant. People talk about Mega Pidgeot. No one talk about Noctowl. Where's, where's the Noctowl enjoyers out there? There's gotta be one person in this comment section out there right now that really, really likes Noctowl. Maybe. Top three, top, top one, favorite, what are you thinking? Level up moves are also random in this game, so Felipez would need some luck. But if he could just find a solid physical flying type attack, he'd be- Oh, they're so smart, they give you right candies. They're so smart, nobody wants to grind. Golden. By the time he'd reached the next gym battle, he hit the jackpot, acrobatics. Not long after learning acrobatics- That's so good. What, what the hell is this? Whoa, 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 we're just gonna gloss over it. What am I looking at right now? Is that a last of us bloater? Next, Felipez ran into one of the craziest bosses of this game. That what? Oh, That's God. A pretty big health bar. Let's just say he was glad to have a move with Acrobatics' oomph here. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh. oh. Hey, you get to do a double battle against it, though. That's pretty sick. Yeah, this is disgusting. Oh my god, that's actually gross. It is definitely The Last of Us inspired. But I love how they have all the fungus Pokemon built into it. Like, I see Parasect. I see Fungus. I see the Gen 7 one, the fairy one that I didn't remember the name of. I see Breloom. I see Toad Squirrel on that with the little legs. It's actually very well designed for a gross, disgusting, horrible creature. What? The fake out and acrobatics combination was enough to make Sopita a key member of Felipe's team throughout the rest of the Nuzlocke. It oh yeah, it's really good. And was the MVP of just about all of them. Fili it would have suck if that thing died. Felipe's run was really clean. From the time he picked up Sopita, he lost all of one Pokemon, his Clefairy. With the help of his coach, Bree, he made it through all of the gym battles and all of their gym challenges, startlingly well done mini games inspired by other games like what? F Zero or Soccer. With Oh my god, they just have, they have mini, gola, gola, gola. They just have mini games where you play football and run away from a fire breathing Charizard? Game Freak genuinely could never. With all eight chips in hand, it was time to overthrow Delta and take down Mark Zuckerberg. I can't believe I'm reading this. After yeah, Zuckerberg and his Galissapod combined to take down Zuck and his evil AI, Felipez had qualified for the second phase and with a pretty healthy box. He oh yeah, hold on a second, let's take a look at that. We got a Swine, we got a Gudra. Executor? Well, I don't know why I excited Executor, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have a Scavalier as well. Look at that, Snorlax, Annihilate, Chandelier, Golden Girl. Oh man, this is such a good box. With the Garchomp and a Tyranitar and a Dust Noir. Oh, this is such a good box, man. Of course, we gotta bring, we gotta bring Sopita. Oh, that's what it is. It's the soup. Sopita is the soup. Box. He also benefited from one of the quirky rules of this tournament. See this Munchlax? Holy fucking shiny. shit! It's kind of hard to tell, but this little guy's shiny, and that means so if you don't understand Spanish, what you said there was, uh, holy 
fucking shit. He's a free encounter for Felipe's. And he's a great one. Snorlax is an annoying Pokemon to face in a double battle because even if both opponents attack him, chances are he's going to live. And then there's a the random move. One of Snorlax's big weaknesses is usually its lack of healing moves like Recover or Soft Boiled, having instead rely on something like the less consistent combination for Cycle plus a Berry. Well, this one has Roost. Don't ask me to- that's insane. Giving Roost to a Snorlax is, I think, against the Geneva Convention. I mean, the logistics of Snorlax making a nest, but with Curse to boost its attack and defense, Drain Punch for healing, and Facade to power through burns, this- Yeah, so I said, it's, it's just, just ridiculous. It's Stab, it doubles its damage if it gets burned. Y you can curse. Like, Roost, what more do you need? This thing was a wall. Just don't ask it to hit any ghost types. Felipe went with two more VGC legends, Garchomp and Goldengo. Running on his team were Glaceon and Dusnor. Unfortunately for Felipe's, he and encountered Dusnor fully evolved. Dusclops has been a much more successful VGC Pokemon thanks to its access to insane levels of bulk through holding an Eviolite. But there was still a lot of cool synergy on this team. Snorlax and Glaceon bait fighting moves that Goldengo and Dusnor can switch into harmlessly. Soapy does Fake Out could enable slower threats like Snorlax and Goldengo to sweep, or let Garchomp get off Earthquakes without having to worry about an Ice-type threat on the other side of the field. Or Unless they're both burned. How did this happen? Why are they both burned? How did this happen? Oh, I guess... Actually, never mind. The Garchomp is a plus two, which means it's neutral. Hitting its partner. And there's one other important aspect of those ghost types on this team that will be quite apparent later. After finishing the Nuzlocke, the streamers had their chances to collaborate with their coaches and put any finishing touches on their teams, as some final moves and held items could really tie everything together. The battles in Phase 2 were mostly played under VGC standard rules, but there were a couple of wrinkles. First off, battles were best of five games, as opposed to the typical best of three you'll see Best of five is a marathon. In a regional or world championship. And in order to keep things spicy and prevent the same strategy from winning three games in a row, players were able to ban one Pokemon from their opponent's team from each game. Fili oh, that is insane. That is such an interesting rule. That changes everything everything. That means if there's a hard counter to something that you really hate, okay, you ban that Pokemon, now you're in a better position, but of course they can ban something from you as well, so maybe they ban a Pokemon that will then do well after their Pokemon's banned. There's so many mind games that can happen there. Oh my god, that's ooh, that's that's fun. Felipe's first opponent, DJ Mario, had some VGC greats in Togekiss, Dragapult, and Gyarados, but the scariest sweeper on his team turned out to be his bulk up Whiskash. Despite Felipe's jumping to a 2-0 lead, in large part thanks to the strength of his gold dango and its dazzling gleams, DJ Mario was able to even things out. But in game 5, Ooh. the hero turned out to be Felipe's Glaceon. Despite the fact that its wide lens was knocked off, it double hit not one, but three straight blizzards onto DJ Mario's boosted nice. cash. The last was a critical hit, dealing just enough damage to let Snorlax finish off a double KO. There's oh man, okay, okay, this Glaceon's going crazy right now. Never underestimate the power of Blizzard spread moves that can potentially freeze. That's why Articuno's been doing go so good recently, even though it's never been good, ever. It's, it's good, doing good now. You spam Blizzard. This is the A button simulator, where you just need one move, and that's all. There's still two Pokemon left, and they're the two Pokemon that have been DJ Mario's anchor this whole set, Togekiss and Dragapult. This one Oh, but they are both weak to Blizzard. It was far from over, but it turned out Felipe's Glaceon wasn't done being blessed by RNGesus. Oh my god, the Fire Blast miss? Oh! That is, oh, that's so bad. And the crit! Oh, that's so insane. Oh, the freeze! That sucks. That is genuinely painful. <laughs> That's me. Uh, yeah, you should apologize. I feel like at that point you need to issue an apology for that. <laughs> Eh, lo siento. O sea, de corazón. What about yeah, so happens. The set wasn't her greatest showing, but the Poke Cup participants would soon learn why Felipe's showdown name was Get Sopita. His round opponent was Revan, who also- Hold on, I saw an edit's note right there. Let me just go ahead and have a, a quick look at what that was. I messed up a render. No, it's okay, Mr. Editor. I, we all mess up sometimes. We all make a little bit of a mess. I make mistakes all the time. In fact, I make more mistakes than I do correct. It was Revan, who also had a team centered around Togekiss and a dragon, this time Dragonite. Game one started with each player trading off special attacks. Felipe's took down Togekiss and Revan took down Glaceon. He finally misses a blizzard for the first time ever. On turn three, everything was finally in position. Primarina had protected on turn two. Both Primarina and Ormaldo were slower and it was time for Sapita to do her thing. Oh no. Yeah, I see it. I see the animation starting to play. Sopita's gonna blow! She's gonna blow! Yo, explosion and make it rain on this turn demolishes that opposing side. Absolutely destroys. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, look at that damage! That's so big! That's so big! <laughs> what character? 
four turns. Te imagínate, te imagínate el coach de Raven viendo esto y diciendo, ¿qué, ¿qué acaba de pasar? Felipe was able to keep it going with Sopita on the bench, thanks to a boosted Snorlax and the power of Goldango's ridiculously diverse move pool, with Scald, Shadow Ball, and Dazzling Gleam all putting in work. But she came back from Game 3 and once again made her presence felt, this time showing it's not just the boom that makes her valuable. Revan had shut down Acrobatics in Game 1 with his Armaldo's Dazzling ability, which prevents any priority attacks like Gale Wing's boosted Acrobatics from going off. The yeah, I was, I was actually confused for a second. I was like, why would that shut down Acrobatics? But they had Gale Wing's. Which you can't like turn off. It's not like a choice that you make. You're like, oh, actually, I don't want priority this turn. Maybe we don't have priority. So Dazzling would just shut down anything that has the Gale Wings boost. So maybe it is a detriment sometimes, but it's mostly positive because Unfastened's not that quick. It's quicker than an Armaldo, certainly, but it's not the fastest thing in the world. So you're always going to want that Gale Wings boost. This time, Sopita was able to launch an Acrobatics into Dragonite. And also, the fake out being priority kind of shuts down the up. It's shut down by Dazzling as well. Despite its strong defense, Dragonite dropped from nearly two-thirds health. Explosion what? took down Togekiss, and although things got tense at the end, Dusknor's Shadow Claws were strong enough to let it outlast Revan's Primarina and lock Ooh. up the 3-0 victory. Just. Next up was Barbecue, another Dragonite trainer. This team had speed in Greninja, power from Amoswine, and defense in the form of Dusclops and Tinkaton. Both trainers traded lucky breaks in the first two games. Barbecue had a nice surprise on his Greninja to deal with Felipe's lead of Glaceon and Goldengo. Overheat, which would have been amazing if it had managed to hit either time. Bar this Glaceon is blessed by the power of God. It must be. There's no other way. This Glaceon is genuinely the main character. We're all talking about Sopita over here. We need to understand that this Glaceon is ridiculous. Barbecue clicked it. Felipez ran away with that game as a result, but the tables turned in game two, when Barb's Mamoswine hit a crit freeze to tie the set. Oh, there's a lot of RNG happening in this right now. Fire. Nah. Oh, that's tough. Felipez could prevent Barbecue's Dust Claps from setting Trick Room, but he was able to use it to his own advantage, getting Glaceon in to spam Wide Lance aided Blizzards and take a double KO. Despite that's huge. down a Conk Holder in Trick Room, Felipez saw the opportunity to push his advantage. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna kill the Greninja. The Greninja's gone. Whoop. Yeah, it's dead. It's gone. Even with that's huge. Conkholder couldn't do enough by itself to make the comeback, and Felipez was in position to advance to the semifinals. Oh, that crit! Honestly, ooh, I wonder if that crit matters. I mean, Kokelda doesn't have the greatest special defense, but Golden Go has no stab on Dazzling Gleam. I feel like it might have been able to tank it. If the Conkelda had a assault vest, it would have lived for sure. But if I had an assault vest, I imagine it would have lived despite the crit, regardless. Greninja came through for barbecue in game four, revealing the insanely strong spread move, Fiery Wrath. Normally Moltres Galar's signature move and landing a huge flinch on Felipez's Garchomp. Felipe Ooh, Fiery Wrath boosted by help in hand. That can also get flinches. That is really good. Also boosted by stab as well. Felipez managed to bring it back to a position where a crit or freeze from Glaceon's Blizzard could have won him the game, but it wasn't in the cards. Was his luck finally running out? It sure seemed Maybe. like it early in game two as Barbecue's Dusclops managed to land Will-O-Wisp burns onto both Sopita and Garchomp, but he found a huge opening on turn six. With Conkholder threatening a huge sucker punch onto Goldengo, he read his opponent and switched out, opening the door for Sopita to take the kill with acrobatics before fainting to its burn damage. Nice. <laughs> nice, that's a really good prediction right there. That's a very, very good prediction. You know, they say these people were not that great at Pokemon before starting this, like they were just generally big streamers. I mean, they've been improving very, very quickly. <laughs> Things still looked bad. Dusclops had reversed Trick Room, and now Greninja was by far the fastest thing on the field, with both Overheat and Fiery Wrath to threaten Felipez. Estamos turbo jodidos. <laughs> How can he wiggle his way out of this one? Glaceon went down to the first Overheat. No misses this time. But Dazzling Gleam barely missed the KO on Dusclops, and now it was surely over. Oh no. Oh, is it? Is it though? Is it, Joe? I don't know if it's over. Oh, nah, yeah. it's not over. Oh. It's not It's not done. Dazzling Gleam can do it. Helping hands? No, you live, you live, you live. Yes! I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. He's got it, he's got it. Dude, the double KO, it's huge. There it is. <coughs> Choice specs saved the day for Felipez, preventing Barbecue from clicking the Fiery Wrath that certainly would have KO'd here. It's hard to fault Barbecue for thinking that Helping Hand Overheat could take down the Goldengo even after the special attack drop, but I bet he was kicking himself for not trying Fiery Wrath instead. Two Helping Hand Fiery Wrath certainly would have taken out both of Felipez's Pokemon. Glaceon's Thunder was scary if it lived the Fiery Wrath, but I have to imagine the combination of its power and the flinch chance gave Barb the best chance of winning in that position. With that, the man whose tournament plan relied on a bird named Soup was just one win away from the finals. What followed in the semifinals against iPand Arena would be Sopita's best performance yet. Come on, Sopita. Wait, the big boom. The big boom. It's coming. It's coming. Esselin has really good defense, though. 
don't know how much it's going to do. Oh, that's a lot of damage. It's a boom. That's all. Oh, that's huge. It's that's so big. We have Scald Golden Girl. With a three on two advantage, not even the download boosted for Ninja or Calmine Tangrowth in the back could stop Fidibus from taking the early lead. Calmine Tangrowth and download Greninja is like ridiculous. Vaya opción. Oh, limpio, coño, vale, uno cero. Bien jugado, bien jugado. Ahora tengo una cosa. Penry That's a solid win. Leading game two, relying on a couple of slow but very physically imposing Pokemon in King Gambit and Ursa Luna. King Gambit's steel typing threatened to make it much more difficult for Felipe's to find his opportunity to explode. But on turn, oh yeah, I was gonna say that this Snorlax has Drain Punch, so it's pretty good against the King Gambit. I also see that they're not using Terrasalizing, which is probably for the best when it comes to like more inexperienced people. I'm I play way too much Pokemon, and I also get bamboozled by Terrasalization all the time as well. Turn two. Ursa Luna protected in front of Sopita, and Felipe saw his chance. Wait, is she gonna read the explosion? No, she doesn't. She doesn't. Oh, big damage. Wait, the heat wave. Oh, the heat wave. Smart. It didn't kill. The bird! The bird! I can't believe that! It was just a 2v2 this time, but Dustnar's U-turn was the perfect answer to both the Greninja and Tangaroth on the other side. Down went Greninja, and that was that. Tangaroth simply couldn't do enough damage to turn the tides, and Philippus went up 2-0. Philippus would get another double KO with his explosion and Scald combination on turn 2, and game- Damn, that's such a good combo! The easiest of the whole set. Thanks to a trio of huge booms, Philippus and Sopita had advanced to the finals. Damn, <laughs> Sopita's doing crazy work here! His opponent would be Susana, who'd been having quite the crazy run of her own. Her team had a few Pokemon Pokemon we've seen before in Dragonite and Primarina, as well as Annihilate, Ferrothorn, Skeledurge, and Tyranitar. She was the one to take down reigning champion Mixwell in a ridiculous Game 5 set, where she showed just how good Water Shuriken and its priority can be on the otherwise slow Primarina. Oh, volume warning. Okay, get yourself ready. Here we go. He didn't use Mock Punch. It's gonna die. He didn't use Mock Punch. Water Shuriken, it goes down. Who the fuck is Jimmy? <laughs> he's calling. He's calling the Venus on Jimmy. He's called Jimmy. He's like, who the fuck is Jimmy? <laughs> Against Skane in the semi. I love excited Spanish people. They're so funny. Oh, they're awesome. Finals, her team just had too many tanks. Her Ferrothorn alone was able to wall most of his threats. She would win 3 and 1, setting up the matchup against Felipe's in the finals. This one looked rough for Sopita and the gang. Susanna had two ghost types in Annihilate and Skeledurge, and two normal resists in Tyranitar and Ferrothorn. It was looking like Felipe's was going to have to win this one, honestly. And that was not part of Honestly. Play. As if Sopita's explosions aren't honest. There's nothing more honest than looking your opponent in the eyes and just blowing your. L blowing. Blowing your, blowing up your birds, blowing using the explosion move with 250 base power. Game 1 showed just how well the pair of Ferrothorn and Tyranitar could deal with Sopita's nonsense. Knock off from Tyranitar, one shot Goldengo, and Annihilate's Thunder Punch nearly got Sopita. Oh so yeah, it's not looking good. Snorlax like set up for a reverse sweep, but it was too little too late. The critical adaption for Game 2 was Garchomp, who was a particularly scary matchup for pretty much all of Susana's Pokemon, even the Primarina that threatened it back with Moonblast. Gar Oh yeah, I mean, if Sopita goes for the- Oh, that, that was the Ferrothorn. I was gonna say, if Sopita follows that up with an Acrobatics onto the Annihilate, like, it's gonna be dead. Trump ran wild, taking a double KO with the aid of some Acrobatics chip on turn 3, and That's it was huge. simply too much momentum for her to overcome. Felipez was able to get huge momentum in Game 3 thanks to Gale Wing's priority, which allowed him to swing with Acrobatics and deal huge damage to Annihilate before Dragon- It's so big. I don't know why he thunder punched into the Golden Go that turn. Maybe he thought Sopita was going to switch out. Was able to counterattack with the attack dropping Breaking Swipe. Snorlax was able to get out on the field and absolutely sit on the combination of Primarina and Skeledurge. Once Sopita was able to switch back in safely on turn 6, it was basically all over. Susanna was done adapting though. Annihilate was able to deal much more damage before going down in game 4, and a good protect call on Sopita's explosion let Susanna get just enough momentum even it's though huge. her Primarina went down. She Oh, Primarina got destroyed there, so it's what, a 2v2 right Down now? Tyranitar and Skeledurge being enough in the endgame, and she was right. Even through Curse, Tyranitar's knockoff did significant damage to Snorlax, and she was able to force a fifth and deciding game. It was right, last game. turn to adapt, and for the first time, he brought 
Glaceon, and it didn't even get to move, taken down by a combination of Annihilate's Drain Punch and Dragonite's Brave Bird. But oh no, it's looking like it might be a loss, boys. Dimitar didn't give up. He found a huge opportunity on turn two, swords dancing with Garchomp in front of Dragonite's Protect and taking out Annihilate with a critical hit. Shadow Ball. So oh, that's so huge. I mean, I don't know if the crit was necessary because Golden Go has a ridiculous special attack anyway, but ooh, the balls on a person to sword stance in front of a Dragonite like that. Oh, it's so big. Suddenly, the tables were turned. Garchomp was extremely threatening with its plus two attack, and it managed to get the KO on Dragonite before dropping to Primarina's Moonblast. Fittingly, it was all going to come down to a 2v2. Felipe's Dusknor and Goldengo against Susana's Skeledurge and Primarina. Now, experience the final two turns of Poké Cup 3 the way they were meant to be experienced, from Spanish okay. streamer's Evi's point of view, as he was screaming his lungs out in excitement as the tournament reached its conclusion. Ah, uh, God, I, I love excited Spanish people. They're, I have no idea what's going on, but it's so fun. Look at this. I mean, just look at the, look at what you're seeing on screen. Look at all the art that you're seeing on screen. What is happening with this Primarina? What is going on? What is going on with that Dragonite just below my head? What is happening? I'm, I'm so confused. <laughs> It's more rapido! Uno pa uno! Uno pa uno! Uno pa uno! Here it comes! It's enough! Damn, that was a great game. Acaba de ser campeón de la Pokémon Twitch Cup. Madre que me parió. Eliminando a Susana, Barbe, Rene. That's so big. That's so exciting. Coach competitivo. ¿Qué ha hecho este tío? If you watch the tournament from Felipe's point of view, you'll see that he was self-deprecating for money. Whoa, 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 whoa. What was that? I, um, so he said, I played terribly. You, you'll see. But the terrorism works, he okay. He was self-deprecating for much of the tournament, lacking confidence in his strategic abilities as a Pokemon player. Entonces, en cuanto salga de la ruta 1, va para el Mar Peña, como si no hubiera un puto... Es que... Estamos jodidísimos, loco. Felipe went in planning just to lean on Sopita. And don't get me wrong, this trash bird put in some incredible work in this tournament. But it says something that Felipe's won the deciding game 5 despite leaving her on the bench. Maybe he really did go in with no plan, and maybe his team didn't make any sense. But it seems to me that if Poké Cup is about anything, it's about taking the chaos it presents you and rolling with the punches. This time around, nobody did that better than Felipe's. And I think the English-speaking Nuzlocke and competitive Pokémon community have a lot to learn from the Spanish-speaking one. Yeah, no, we do. We definitely do. That's so cool. Oh, that was such a good video as well from, from Jan. That's absolutely fantastic. I mean, he's been doing a lot to bring, like, the international communities of different Pokemon players and, and just, like, tell people about them. Like, he found China's best Nuzlocke. You should definitely watch that video. That's a great video as well. He's been bringing a lot of people in. I think that's really cool. So please make sure to subscribe. Typical one challenges. Oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Peachel now, as he's called. It's never a bad idea to do that. In fact, I would say it's always a good one. And if you want to see more of my dumb face, then you can always subscribe here as well.